Good morning, students. Uh, today's course is uh, titled International Relations, Introduction to International Relations. The course in it is two, half section, you know, 2020 to 2021. My name is Amadou Ochoche Eneje. My office is one to see me anytime. Is in the Department of Political Science and International Relations in the mini campus. My phone number is here for you to uh, get contact with me, and my email address is also there. My office, as I've mentioned, is at the other side of uh, the university mini campus. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, students, you have in my class, you have course and class rules. Students who are absent for class will lose their marks for attendance. Students who submit their assignment late than due date and time will lose total marks obtainable. Students who are unruly you know, during chats, discussions, and other class interactions will lose one mark, mark of the total mark of the total marks obtainable. All assignments for the course will be submitted electronically through the email provided in the facilitator's profiles unless otherwise instructed. Ladies and gentlemen, you have seen the course outline. Uh, is there for you to be able to get uh, what I'm teaching you out of. Because if I'm not available, you can go through them yourself. And be able to do your personal research to be able to get what you want. You have basic you know, concept in international relations. You have meaning of international political system, origin of states, actors in international relations, foreign policy as an instrument for you know, promotion of national interest, you have national power, you have diplomacy as tool for international polit politics, you have international law and globalization. Ladies and gentlemen, you can look at it introduction. The course focuses on the careful, thorough, and critical exposition, you know, examination of the nature and character of the relationship between nations at the international arena, which is term international relations. The lecture also look at the nature and the scope of international relations. It exposes and or explains how the relationship have brought about the way and manners nation states are using this relationship to maximize their, inter, I mean, national interest. The study has been divided into ten components for the purpose of understanding, meaning nature and scope of international relations. You have no nation. As is an island, a no nation is an attack, you know, or can ever live in an isolation. Every nation of the world, in the way or live in the way and manner that other interacts with, outside because of the degree of relationship and dependence characterize it. Thus, it is apt to understand the concept of international relations. We want to know the essence of interactions that exist between and among states. The, for the continuation, understanding foreign policy, diplomacy among, you know, others since 1948, when Hans J. Morgenthau published his first books called Magnum's Opus, and entitled Politi Politics Among Nations. The central question has remained that international relations, what is international relations? Is international relations a sub- field for political science or a field of its own. <laughs> international relations and international politics. International relations and international politics can be used interchangeably. Some use, the, use them interchangeably, but the fact remains that international relations itself has a vast background. It, has, it covers every transaction, I mean transaction amongst the nation states. Includes economics, politics, and all otherwise. The actors in this field are states, you know, non-state actors. You have uh, 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 the capacity of some other things like terrorist groups. You have wars, the actions of the international politics itself is interrelations or interaction between states, the nation states, and the international system. International relations as a discipline. It's a vast field of knowledge. 
and it has, it covers almost every aspect of interactions among states or uh, the non-state actors that are involved in transactions with multinational relationships, I mean multinational organizations like, you know, the Dangotes of the world, you have the Julius Beggars of the world, you have, you know, some other international, multinational corporations that forms part of international, uh, 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 the scope of these international relations. Basic approaches to the study of international relations. You have traditional, uh, you know, and, and classical approach, which, you know, before the advent of the second, first world war, the scholars of international relations were basically reduced to study the acts of war, how the world emanates, and then the, the issue of peace. And, but, but, but with the, that approach, the coming of the Second World War, the, the, the behaviors of the, 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 the actors in terms of uh, the scholars changed because they had to focus their area of study, you know, to, to look at not just the issue of war and peace, but to study the human persons, the p human beings, and the states that are always involved in this uh, a war. Then you have basic approach to the study of international relations. You have, you have them already. You have the uh, uh, the, tra the traditional and, and a classical approach. You have behavioral approach. The behavioral approach use scientific, you know, empiricism to be able to study what are the causes of war, and what are those, uh, 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 you know. Uh, method or methodology to be used to be able to bring, you know, human beings, you know, to, to proper interactions so that the world can be uh, good for everybody to live in. You have the post-behavioral approach. You know, look, we, we, the post-behavioral approach uh, in this field, the scientists in this regard began to look at the structure of the world to be able to, you know, come and set issues of morality should be brought into the burner of international relations. And so uh, we move to some basic concepts in international relations like the multipolar system, this, which is multipolarism. Uh, this happens, you know, uh, between the 1970s, I mean, uh, 19, 19, I mean, 1700, uh, at when the issues of um, uh, the European, you know, uh, industrialization started from from um, Britain in 1700. That's you know catapulted almost all the European Union uh, in Europe to be able to go into industrialization, mechan mechanic you know mechanical uh, aspect of uh, issues that have to do with international relations. And you have methodological approach that brought about technology into Europe. And so you have this structure in place, and then, you know, that was what brought about most of the nations in Europe into wars, because they have stratified structure of, of institutions that, you know, gave them that approach to look at themselves as the strongest, you know, uh, people in the world. And so that was what brought about the First and the Second World War. And then you have the Cold War period. This was the period between, I mean, 1955, I mean, 1945 to 1990, when uh, you know you have one structure that was ideologically different with the United States of America and its allies. You have the Soviet Union and its allies. In the United States and its allies, you have NATO, which is the the arms unit of the of the uh, uh, the West. And then you have Warsaw from the other side of the Soviet Union. So this was a period that there was a conflict and contradictions in terms of uh, the bipolarity, uh, you know, having the ideological. Uh, then you have arms and uh, arms race in Europe. You know, the period. This period also was the period that, you know, most of these bipolar countries terms of uh, America and Russia were involved in, you know, bringing, you know, multiplying the weapons of mass destruction 
in order to you know to to serve as deterrence to one uh, one another. It wasn't a confrontational period, but it was a, a period that most of the world uh, uh, were were aligned. Uh, uh, I'm talking about the the other side that were not involved in this war. They were seriously, you know, gathering weapons of mass destruction. I'm talking about the United States of America and its allies, and the Soviet Union from the other end. Uh, you can uh, look at it from the in 1962, uh, what happened in, uh, in Cuba, the Cuban Missile Crisis that brought about almost a near nuclear war into the, the world, but it was it was uh, an approach by the, uh, the former president of the United States of America, J. F. Kennedy, and that of uh, the, uh, uh, Nikita Khrushchev, the premier of the Soviet Union, that they had a meeting and then decided to to curb that crisis, that crisis that was almost taking uh, a very different dimensions in the world. Then you have that period also who had balance of power. The balance of power is between the two bipolarist, I mean bipolarist uh, nations, the Soviet Union again and the, um, the United States of America and their allies, you know, and and this brought about uh, the confrontations, not fully conventional warfare, but arms race, you know, that they were gathering weapons of mass destruction, and the other person was, you know, co compiling and stockpiling, but it wasn't a war that had to do with confrontations, and that was why it was called Cold War. The detent. Detent was a period where there was a relaxation of this uh, a gathering of these weapons of mass destruction. You know, the the, the violations of these weapons was brought to, to to bear and then brought to a peaceful uh, uh, manner by which it was it was neutralized. And then you have the reapproachment. Reapproachment was a period of total elimination of these uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction. And which, what, what causes the rapprochement? It was in 1990 that the disintegration of the Soviet Union that brought about the unipolar system, unipolarism was brought about by, by the disintegration of the Soviet Union that, that collapsed into almost 15 countries. And this was you know, uh, brought about again by the former, the former uh, uh, pre president of the Soviet Union. I'm talking about Mikhail Gorbachev. He brought about the fundamental changes in the Soviet uh, Union governance, about democratization, about liberalization. And so some of the... Uh, 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 governments and people of this of different strata that formed the Soviet Union got angry with that principle and said there was no need for to liberalize the system and some of them lost their strength and lost their powers and so they decided to go their ways and that was what brought about um, uh, unipolarism in the world. America now has become the world power. They are the police of the world because there, there are no other other powers in the world that can challenge the strength of America, and so America can do and undo as far as the world system today is concerned. And that you take example from uh, the issue of moving to Iraq. If the issue was tabled uh, within the uh, the United Nations Organization among the uh, permanent members of the Security Council. Some of the members vetoed the decision of, 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 the, of, of, of the council. But America unilaterally went you know, to Iraq, removed their president, and then brought about you know, a conflict, a very reasonable conflict that you know, took the life of almost 40,000 people in Iraq. Then you have, again, the disarmament and arms control, which uh, is the opposite of the arms race that I've mentioned uh, previously. The arms race, the disarmament and arms control, it came about, you know, about when the detent and then the reapproachment came. 
and then began to preach about the use of arms. But the fact remains that how can those people that are involved in producing arms are the same people preaching about how to control it? Most of the weapons that are produced in Europe and America are lost in Africa, especially in Nigeria. And so you can look at it from that angle to look to say, are we really very uh, reasonable in terms of uh, uh, the world issues? Are we reasonable in terms of uh, the, the, the calling the world as, as, as an entity? You know, we'll be able to come together to say what we are doing, especially in America and Europe, that how can the weapons that have been produced in America and Europe be lost in Africa, especially in Nigeria, in the hands of terrorists, in the hands of bandits? And so we should be able to curb it from that direction before we will we'll be able to talk about the world as a unity that we are not unifying by our actions. We should be able to see that we are unifying by our actions. We have non-alignment. The non-alignment was, you know, you know, was coined by by Alfred Savey in 1955. For those people that are not were not involved in this crisis that was developed by the European uh, nations, especially the. Americans and the Eastern Europe. The non alignment were those group of nations that were, you know, that were teetered towards, you know, having their independence from colonialism, the colonial masters, different colonial, colonial masters. But they decided that they were not going to be part of this struggle for powers within two bipolar systems. And so that was what brought about you know, uh, that name, and uh, non-alignment. But the fact remains that sometimes non-alignment can be alignment because wh while you are going to have a meeting to be able to discuss issues that have to do with the world's um, system, you are already forming an, a structural uh, department which is called oligarchical structure. And so forming an alignment, uh, non-alignment is part of our alignment. And that is what I want to bring to the students to understand, that alignment, non-alignment is another alignment. And so if we look at it from that structure, mechanically and then scientifically to be able to see how the international system are being run by those uh, world powers. Meaning of international political system. The meaning of international political system, the concept of international system and world system can be used interchangeably for the students of international relations in, to understand the international political system. The concept of system must be understood according to Oxford English Dictionary. System is a set of assemblages of things, connected, associated, and interdependence so as to form a complex you know, unit or unit arrangement according to some scheme or plan. Meaning of international system. International system, as we have discussed you know, uh, previously, is, is a conglomeration of states coming together to form that structure. You know, that according to uh, some experts in, in uh, international trade, structural functionalism you know, forms, you know, you have a subsystem which are states then you have the international system, which, you know, uh, the other states of the world are coming together to be able to perfect the system by interacting with each other, by forming groups, by forming, you know, meeting other nation states. And while other nation states are meeting together, there are, some are discussing issues of warfare, some are discussing issues of peace, some are discussing issues of mil um, uh, military assistance, some are discussing issues that have to do with their internal economy or internal populations. Then you have evolution. Another point is the evolution of international political system. You know, there are divergent views about what international political system is all about. But we have to trace it nostalgically to be able to know that the foundations or where it started it matters. And so we we'll trace where it started from. The 
Westphalia Treaty of 1648 that brought about, you know, all the nations of the Europe together. In fact, the, that Westphalia Treaty was held in a city called Osama Brook. Osama Brook was a place, Osama Brook was a place in Westphalia in Germany that that meeting was held in 1648. That was what brought to an end the 30 years of European wars, you know, that all those dynasties and empires could be able to come together to form nation states. And that was the beginning of how some of states began, began to have their independence of creating their own nations to be able to have a sovereign state. You know, the, another point is the hegemony of Europe, of Europe and imperialism. You can remember or recall that in 16th century, in 16th century, something happened in Europe. Some, while some people are sleeping in the world, in other nations, other nations of the world are, are awake. You know, some in Europe went into, you know, what, what is referred to as, you know, scientific oblivion to be able to think of how things are going to be manufactured. Because as at that time, they were physically, you know, indulging in working with food. And so they began to think, how can somebody work with food on so much distance? And then they went into producing, you know, the mechanical structure that brought about industrial revolutions in, in Britain. And that was what skyrocketed into almost all the European nations and they began to produce and continue to produce some mechanical values that we are calling today. You have, you have the laptops of this world, you have cars of this world, you have an aircraft of this world, you know, that were generated, the idea were generated, I mean, generated from the, uh, the Britain in 1700. You no, know, that was what brought about the, I mean, the bipolarism, the, the issues of producing weapons of mass destruction that we are calling today, uh, 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 calling the world to order today. We we're, were started from that time. And so we can see the issues of the electronics. You see, aircrafts were, I mean, was produced first from Spain, that is close to Africa here, close to Libya. Because some people, while we are sleeping, while we are murmuring, while we are disintegrating, while we are killing ourselves in Africa, some are thinking about how their next generations are going to be provided with smooth and then conducive environment. The era of Cold War, the era of Cold War I've mentioned, that was the period that um, the confrontation between the United States of America and its allies, and then the uh, USSR and its allies. You know, on the United States part, they had NATO, North Atlantic uh, Treaty Organization, and then Warsaw on the other side of the um, uh, Soviet Union. You have issues that characterize the current international system. The issues like issues of dependency, the issues of marginalization by uh, of, of the powerful nations by by I mean the the, the low uh, uh, developed nations by the powerful nations like United States of America and their allies. The issues of you know a Palestinian Israeli crisis. Are uh, the contemporary issues in the world politics today? How are they going to solve it? Can the United States of America and the most powerful nations, uh, other most powerful nations, they will turn back why Israel, uh, Israeli and the Palestinians are dying every day? Those are the contemporary issues. And the issues of the have and the have not. The issue of the have and the have not is the issues between those advanced, technologically advanced countries and those ones that are low countries like Nigeria. And so those issues have to be so that we have a check and balance in the world system. And then the issues of the third world and the first world. How can you have international uh, uh, relations or international system that is bipolar, I mean bipolaristically organized? And tomorrow you say we are all brothers in the world. We cannot be brothers while other people are highly rich and the other people are highly poor. Uh, uh, next time as we are coming, we are going to take the origin of states to 
be able to you know, advance our cause, to be able to look at what international relations is all about. Thank you very much and God bless you.